Hello everyone. We are still working on Miles. And the creaking noise from my uh, bar stool chair should, should be gone now. Because I had ordered a new drafting desk uh, sort of th table. Well, the table I've had, but the chair to go with the table. I would ordered it, it just came. Um, and I literally assembled it right beforehand, so <laughs> we'll see. If you see me suddenly fall out uh, or scream, that would be why, because the chair is uh, taking some getting used to. Anyways, so, Miles. Um, let's see here. I think I'm pretty happy with little dude's face, body, suit, and all the details as such, other than I gotta put some detail in his um, cheese wedge. Um, pin and also a little more in the sign um, but it is paint pen time and if I hate what I've done then I guess I'm gonna have to go over it and there'll be more videos but hey the deadline as I speak to you it is Sunday night right now technically the deadline if I'm going to put this in the couch and exhibition is uh, Wednesday you can, people still enter stuff late, but cost twice as much. Now, granted, entry is only two bucks, but I'm cheap. And I want to hit the actual deadline. So, because I actually volunteer with CowX, so, you know, it would kind of be good if I followed the rules, maybe. Um, anyways, so, let us get going and take a leap. Um... A whole bunch of brushes here that I don't know that I'll be actually using. And uh, yeah, so I basically need a piece of paper to thwack these on. We're going to start with some yellow. And this is, it's Montmartre. So if you live in Canada and you're familiar with Home Sense, these are just cheap ass. At least this set is uh, cheap ass acrylic paint pens that I got at Home Sense. I mentioned before I have others that are. Uh, from Amazon. I do have some of the like PBO, PBO, PABO, whatever the hell they are uh, that I got from Michaels. And we know how it is. Everything at Michaels costs more than it should. Um, so, but uh, generally uh, not too crazy affordable. I know the Poscas are like the really crazy expensive paint pens apparently. Um, I don't have any. But uh, yeah, so. What I'm kind of thinking, first of all, I should see if these are going to even show up, but I'm thinking of kind of doing little circles in the stripes to add some texture. So we'll start over here. Oh, well, that one actually came out green. Water-based ink. Oh, paint pen, water-based ink. Well, paint and ink are not the same thing, now are they? Huh. Well, let's see here. I don't know that that's actually going to... It kind of shows up in there. It's one of those things where if it... It might not be a bad thing if it's really subtle. But actually, it's funny. It shows up much more on the camera than it does on the actual... Um, that I can see with my bare eyes. Um, Granted, you know, I'm a woman of a certain age, so <laughs> I was reading the look at the instructions for the chair, uh, the new chair, and going like, do I need to get my glasses out of my purse? You know, my friends warned me, uh, your vision will change, because you know, I'm in a, one of the embroidery guilds, and I'm going to stand up for this. Um, and I was doing stuff like cross stitching on 22 count ADA, so 22 little X's per inch. Um, I don't know if this is doing anything at all. Um, I freaking can't tell. You know what? This pen is probably too close. I may end up doing it anyways. But if I do, I'm not going to do it on camera because it's just going to look like I'm not doing anything. Um, Maybe. I don't know. 
the little uh, monitor makes it look like it does show up, but um, let's go for something that actually shows a little bit more visually um, <laughs> if I'm standing here. But anyways, what I was going to say, got an orange one, so tap, tap, thwack, 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 there we go. Um, I'm going to test this on the top side. Okay, that one does show up. I'm mean, for the these. I'm just gonna put dots. Uh, it may look dumb, but whatever. Um, no, what I was gonna say is I do cross stitch, and I was, you know, I joined the uh, local embroidery guild in I don't know, 2018 or something. People were like, "Your vision's gonna change," because I was stitching on tw 22 count Ada, and I did not wear um, reading glasses at the time. And I thought, oh, that's silly. I wear contacts. Well, I already have my, um, you know, I'm already good. I won't need that. Sure enough, what was it, two years ago, suddenly I'm going like, I can see the holes in the Ada, but I couldn't get the needle through them. I could see the needle. I could see the holes. But somehow when I went to put the needle through the holes, that part it would just go kind of fuzzy or wobbly. So I I have been reading, getting reading glasses over the last couple of years and found initially I only needed it um, for that sort of thing and now I'm using them all the freaking time. I, uh, I do, I mean my initial imp impression was that it had to do with uh, lighting and even like Earlier this weekend, I was outside reading something that had small print, could read it just fine. Went with the same um, book and the same small print inside. Suddenly, I needed my glasses to be able to see it. Um, so there's that. Now, of course, obviously, a real flag, they probably wouldn't put any kind of tiny detail like this because it would just make it frickin' irritating. Um, while I've got the camera up here, I'm going to do this corner too. Um, and then I tilt the thing and it doesn't show. Never mind. Um, but, you know, this is a cartoon, so... I'll just add some extra texture and kind of makes this a little more orange. I will need to wrap that around the sides, but that's another thing I will do off camera because it's going to be slow and irritating. So. Anyways, like I said, I do volunteer with the uh, couch and exhibition, so that's kind of a fun thing to do. It's my, it's the closest I get to civil, or civic, um, civic involvement, let's say. Like trying to get myself on this chair. The seat bed is slightly tilted forward, I find, and I can't seem to untilt it. <laughs> So I'm like always going like, oh, am I going to slide off? I say always, and I also told you I assembled it like 20 minutes before I started the video, but always in that time. <laughs> so long enough time to kind of go, eh, this one may always kind of, yeah, at least it has like the, uh, it's kind of a bar stool height adjustable, but at least it has the, um, the foot ring. Some of the, some, you know, you get to some places, like bars and restaurants are the worst for it, and I get it because they want to um, be able to move their bar stools in on the high tables, like if you have an area that has a lounge or whatever, but then they don't have any sort of foot rest. It's like, okay, so what, I'm supposed to sit here for 45 minutes with my legs just kind of dangling in midair? Screw you. <laughs> I always, when 
if we're asked at a place like that, I'm like, uh, I'll take one of the low tables. I don't care. I'll wait 20 minutes for a booth, but I am not sitting all the way up. It's one of those things where it almost feels like exercise to stay in the chair because you're pushing yourself up. Maybe I'm just lazy and out of shape. Could be. Could be. Either one of those. Right. So, I'm going to try and go quickly. Uh, I think what I might do is sort of start some of the texture so I know what I'm doing in that area and then kind of move on. Just because, you know, if I do this, these many little dots for... Come on camera. So I have to move the tripod maybe. If I have to do that many dots all over the whole thing, well, you know, just the dots alone will take an hour and it's going to be very boring YouTube. Uh, it may be boring YouTube regardless, of course, but... Um, oh, hey, I have an ochre colored. So let's test this one under his armpit, or we'll test this one under his tail, because that's kind of a area that's e small and easy to hide if this sucks. Um, so, and this is one of the PBO, PBO the, the acrylic paint markers you get at Michael's. Get that, that, tap, 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 tap. Now we got some ink going. So, uh... Yeah, that's kind of neat. Kind of like a Cheerio texture. It's very similar, of course, to uh, the color in the other stripes. But I think if I do some layers of these circles, and then do some with the yellow. And I, what I might do too, although, you know, we're getting towards the end of this uh, process, but I may sort of texture and then tomorrow after it's dry kind of go over with paint on the brush not completely but just kind of like to wipe it in and out that might be kind of a cool effect or not but we'll see if I, again if i hate it i will just have to paint the stripes again so let's do That's kind of a bit of an echo of like cheese bubble texture. So again, I am I'm gonna lay stuff in and then I may talk while I go through and do it, but I don't want it to all just be like here's an hour of me drawing little circles. Um, so let's have a look back down at the sign because we had we started with some like triangular stuff and I'm going to continue with some triangles to kind of fill in the background and then I'm going to see I might go in and go over those with like the hot pink um, where it's kind of almost out of ink. Uh, I say ink but you know paint and um, so now I'll kind of uh, combo better somehow. So yeah, um, couch exhibition, it's a fairly rural, you know, like the area is in the couch and valley. There's still a lot of rural, um, agricultural culture and, um, business here, but it's also kind of becoming like a far flung suburb of, um, Victoria, which is the provincial capital. So, in fact, I think I heard that, you know, the population of the valley is something like, uh, I don't think it's quite 100,000 yet, but it's like headed that way. And I heard it's 20,000 or 25,000 people 
drive from the Couch and Valley down to work in Victoria every Monday through Friday. So that's like a quarter of the population, but you figure we have a lot of retirees here. We have a lot of families here. So like in terms of like the working population, it's probably, you know, half, maybe more than half uh, actually work in um, Victoria. Because I think what kind of happened is a lot of people who were from Vancouver when they retired, you know, real estate prices in Vancouver have gone insane. And also it's, traffic's gone insane. Like everything in Vancouver's gone insane. So I think a lot of people were kind of like, over the last, well, I'm saying 10 years that I kind of have experience with. I've lived here since not quite 10 years, but like seven years. Um, but uh, going back, you know, I think a lot of people have kind of like, they may have come here for vacations at some point and whatever. And then when it came time to retire, screw it. They're, they want to cash out in the Vancouver market, um, especially if they were able to do that you know, in the bubble, um, and then have a more slow-paced life that kind of was more, uh, more on a human scale, let's say. So, and they, you know, people will pick Victoria because it's um, like Vancouver, but, you know, not <laughs> different enough to be uh, tolerable. Um, and then... People, so then Victoria started to bubble, so then people started getting priced out of the Victoria uh, real estate market. So then they were like, screw it, we'll just drive the Malahat, you know, because uh, I don't know exactly what the real estate is like now, but you know, seven years ago, a uh, single family house on a decent sized lot, depending on the part of town and how many bedrooms, it'd be like 400 grand, 450. Um, as opposed to at that point, that was like seven, eight hundred in Victoria. Now something like that is over a million in Victoria, I believe. Like I said, I haven't checked in on it. Um, and in Vancouver, like even then, something like that would be like two million easy. So anyway, so the Vancouver people, and I, I was one of them. Hey, I, I spent my whole life in Vancouver until a few years, you know, until seven, eight years ago. Um, we came here, we drove up the uh, real estate price, and then the people couldn't afford uh, Victoria anymore, so then they moved to Duncan, and then people couldn't afford Duncan, and then Couch and Valley, and people moving to, you know, Lake Cowichan, or, you know, Ladysmith, Shimanus, Um and all these areas have gotten kind of more expensive. And I think there's an old, like, John Stewart. You remember the guy who was, um, you know, stand-up comedy, John Stewart, who used to be in charge of The Daily Show. I remember a bit he had from one of his stand-up shows, and he was talking about his granddad, who was a uh, Russian immigrant, Russian-Jewish immigrant, but somehow hated immigrants. So the joke was that Grandpa was at Ellis Island, and... Um, as soon as he got his papers, he turned around and looked at the guy behind him in line and said, Get out, you're ruining my country. <laughs> uh, we're kind of like that uh, here about, you know, all these Vancouver people coming here to dunk it. It's like, yeah, but we're from Vancouver. Yeah, but that's different. It's all the people who came after us. <laughs> yeah. Um... see. The usual thing, right? Everybody wants to go somewhere better and... You know, kind of sucks if you're the people who were already there. Unless, of course, you're looking to sell your place and move. Because then it's great because your real estate price is jacked up, right? Um, but anyways, so uh, what was the point of saying that? I don't know. Uh, I forget now. Um, I was saying something about the couch. Oh, yeah, couch and exhibition. So... Anyways, Cowix is kind of fun because it's still got a lot of, um, it's a small fair. It's got a lot of, like, the small rural type stuff. Like, we're going to have sheep shearing demonstrations this year. Um, we have, there's barns there, and uh, at the exhibition, the barns are taken over um, by quilts um, for, 
she used to take up like half of the hall exhibitions, exhibits for me. And um, then the quilts got to be so massive of an area that um, they got put out in uh, the horse barns. Uh, I mean, not all the horse barns. I think there's, yeah, there's still one that um, has actual horses. Um, and then there's like 4-H stuff and all that sort of stuff. So that's kind of fun. Um, and uh, then there's the needlework division, which is uh, kind of what I'm involved with. Um, I'm not going to have any actual needlework in the exhibition this year, though, because... Um, well, because I'm lazy, but mostly because I've been working on cartooning stuff like this. And also for a while I was having issues with um, my right hand and wrist, so I couldn't really hold a needle for like, I don't want to say four months, but like three months, I think. Um, which is to say I wasn't stitchy enough that I could have gotten anything finished. I mean, I could have if I had like started things earlier, but uh, anyways. So, um, and that's starting to develop. That's kind of neat. Um, anyways, but uh, Miles might be in the fine arts section, which is kind of a fun little area. I think last year I put in a monotype of one of my characters, Noah, getting a no. It's like Noah wearing, I mean, you can't see his dick or anything, but like he's clearly naked, just covering you know, with his crotch covered by a giant uh, maple leaf. I called it like Noah Thorson's Canada Day celebration or something like that, where he's clearly drunk and running around naked after having a few too many Molsons on Canada Day. Anyways, that got like a third place ribbon <laughs> in the printmaking division, which was fun. Um, I actually had a book, an artist book uh, involving Miles. I did I mention something about I think I might have said something about that in the very first video. I'm going to zoom in this way a little bit more. Um, but it was like Miles and the Endless Rat Race, but it was Miles with his original character name. I think I told that story about like some strange woman sending me a kind of nasty um, direct message on Facebook on behalf of a third party who had the same name as Miles's original character name and like which by the way you're allowed to do uh, fictional as long as it's not him like if the guy was an accountant who was running for office or something like that and I drew him with the same name and a rat then hypothetically speaking although in that case it depends if they're considered a public figure or, person, or private person or whatever, but in theory you could possibly have legal issues, but like never heard of the dude, it would be fine, but uh, she came across really weird and kind of threatening and I found out they, you know, they don't live on the opposite side of uh, the country, which is a concern. Um, so I just decided to give him a new name, but um, that artist book actually, um, Got a blue ribbon first place last year, so that was fun. Um, I did not get any art. Well, I got some tiny zines done, but like nothing that I would like consider finished enough to uh, put in the artist book category. So my entries this year are going to be this painting is the plan, and. Um, also, uh, another print because I've been doing more monotypes. I don't know if the print will involve uh, Noah or if it'll be... I have a couple of miles, but... Um, and I've got a whole bunch of Ricky. His buddy Ricky B. Rat. So, so that's kind of developing. And I think what I'm going to do is take the pink... I had on the letters and do some thinner lines in between. I'm going to start with kind of outlining his name and sort of see if I'd like that look. Um, got any 
any juice in this? Maybe a little bit. Oh, this looks like a different shade of pink. That's okay. We're gonna go with it. So, and the, if the noise is annoying, my apologies. These particular ones can be kind of scratchy. I'm kind of looking for something that ends up uh, becoming quite layered, you know, so um, basically because I know it's not a, uh, like perfect lines or whatever, so I want to kind of emphasize that and make it uh, pop and look deliberate. I think I gave my little spiel about uh, shaky hands in the last video or the video before that. So that's what we're going to do. And, um, this I'm kind of really liking that texture, so I'm going to bring it a little messier over here. Now what I'm kind of feeling is I want to bring in um, the bl his blue from the jacket because we don't really have, I mean, we've got in tiny corner, I'm pointing at stuff that's not in the frame again. There we go. Um, like we've got, aside from uh, his jacket, we've got the blue in like showing through in little spots, right? Uh, from the underpainting. But what I want to do is bring some of that into his sign so that it makes a little bit more sense. And also, I mean, I swear, I don't know, and the little um, monitor screen that flips around on the camcorder, this looks like it's blue pen. It's not. It's pink. It came out of the one that's in my hand, which does look pink. Of course, I've said that on a couple things where the color looked off, and then when I actually saw it, um, when I was editing, it's like, oh, I was talking about it looking all messed up, but it looks perfectly fine. I sound like an idiot. Whatever. So back to um, the cheap ones and part into the, the thwacking. Thwack, 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 thwack. Come on, come on. Come on, ink. You can make it all the way to the tip. There we go. This is actually almost like a dead on for his jacket color. So let's pull out. I think I'm just going to kind of yeah, give it some rays that look like that. Also, that kind of goes with uh, little dude's whiskers, right? Because I don't, obviously, actual mice and rats have tons of whiskers coming out of their face. Uh, I just draw three per cheek. So, but it's going to kind of bring that look. There. And maybe I'm gonna go under the U. Angles U. Do we want to? Yeah, let's do this. I think I started that with the greens, and then we got that as well. And do we want to kind of do one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. That's better. Okay, now let's uh, let's add some texture with the cheese markers in both of these. Now this one might be a little too light. But I don't think I have a darker orange, so and, 
excuse me, while I'm tapping away and thunking and probably making annoying noises. Come on. I get why they do this with acrylic pens, uh, because you kind of want, you don't want it to like be in the nib and dry out, but it is an annoying way that you have to start the show, so to speak. So that is almost the same color. Yeah, we want to avoid that. So... Okay. I'll set that aside. What, what else have we got in here? Now, this is kind of a brown marker. Um, raw sienna, but raw sienna is a sort of an orangey brown, so I'm going to try and get this going. Let's see here. Kind of, you know. Uh, of course, the funny thing is, uh, orange cheeses don't really have um, bubbles, like holes in them, but uh, or a little, little thing like accuracy get in the way. See, that kind of, I mean, it looks almost more like a pizza slice than cheese, but there we go. And now let's do something similar with his little cheese pan. Did I say cheese pan? Can't even talk. Little cheese, well, cheese pin, P-I-N. There we go. So we got that. Now, do, do, do. I am thinking I am gonna start blathering while I uh, apply marker to larger areas with uh, in the background because. I'm kind of thinking I want to do what I've just done here around these letters. I think I want to outline on him, but I want it to be like the very top layer. So if it happens to go over into the background, it, you know, these little circly things need to be underneath it. So settle in. Uh, we'll see how far we get with this process. Um, yeah, so Calyx, blah, blah, blah. I've been like rambling semi-incoherently about Calyx for a few videos, haven't I? Um, but hey, it's a fun thing. It's one of those things where, you know, kind of look and go. It seems like such a, um, almost like a superficial kind of uh, deal, but then you kind of look and go. But actually, when you think about like community cohesion and all this, um, sometimes those like fair type things or entertainment, you know, it actually ends up being a much bigger deal in terms of, um, you know, community cohesion and quality of life than people really think about. It's a, aside from the whole fun thing, it's also like a space for the community to come together and um, sort of see what everybody else is doing, or at least everybody who's participating is doing. Um, we regularly at the embroidery booth, we get people going like, oh, my grandma used to do that kind of stuff. And it kind of sparks, you know, memories and whatnot. But it's also, um, a lot of those embroidery forms are kind of under threat because, you know, they were regional at one time and um, then it doesn't take long for the knowledge of how to do it to uh, kind of fade out um, and it is part of excuse me I'm like going to burp it is part of your local culture right what kind of embroidery do you do uh, pretty much every uh, culture has a textile um, component to it, whether it's like a format of weaving or, you know, a particular kind of knitting, like, you know, like say Icelandic yoke knits, um, 
or a particular kind of embroidery and a lot of those then become threatened especially when you get um like globalization in the culture um it's kind of i mean that happens with like food too like where people you know you get young uns young kids kind of getting um into the whole like mcdonald'sification of food and then that's kind of what they want to eat but instead of traditional foods and some of that recipe those recipes become endangered in a sense and whatnot and i'm gonna have to stand up to do some of this and hopefully not block the camera too too much um and you end up with some of those art forms dying out then um and embroidery is just one um so and you think about it like traditionally embroidery knitting and all that were times that you know the women of a society would kind of come together and talk and whatnot uh, you have that also with like quilting bees um so when that hobby kind of vanishes well first of all i mean traditionally it wasn't a hobby it was uh we need to do this to you know like quilting that is a survival thing of being warm enough and not dying in winter right and reusing um old textile scraps now of course it's like a luxury hobby um but um traditionally of course it, it wasn't um but it's the sort of thing that fosters community and whatnot. And so it, anyways, my point is something like a fair can kind of seem like a very um, superficial sort of thing. Like, oh yeah, grandma's going to put her quilt in and get a ribbon or try to or whatever. But, you know, it shows a lot of um, the traditional um, workmanship and I mean, it's, um, and then it also encourages the next generation to pick it up. Obviously, not everyone is going to have the time. And you do have um, differentiation uh, in terms of age groups. So, you know, there's certain quilt styles that are very um, grandma. And then you get like the whole modern quilt guild, although the average age in the modern quilt guild is probably, you know, it's probably still like 50. Um, and a lot of the designs are uh, not are basically just using louder colors and like solid colors in like traditional quilt blocks and all that because it's very um, loosey goosey as for definition of what constitutes a modern quilt. Um, and then there's art quilting and all this sort of stuff. But, um, you know, in theory, it you kind of want to encourage the next generation to pick that sort of stuff up. And the fun thing with um, that I've noticed on like social media and whatnot with um, how many ums am I going to say today? But I'm like thinking and drawing at the same time and uh, about different things. But you get um, there is actually I would say a resurgence of uh, embroidery on social media. Uh, floss tube on YouTube is kind of like the big one that people see. Um, where, and I used to like, actually, some of you, you know, I don't know how many of my subscribers are actually watching these versus, you know, um, current followers on Facebook clicking the link or whatever, but, you know, I used to, years ago, I did do floss tube videos. I think I've like hidden most of them just because I've not that's not my focus so much anymore um so the channel's more about um art that i'm doing but um i didn't i do remember kind of noticing a progression on um floss tube where it would be someone comes in they start talking about um the cross stitch designs that they like and then as they become more uh, especially for a new stitcher as they become more um proficient uh, eventually some people, not always, but some people start getting bored with cross stitch and they're not that there's anything necessarily boring about cross stitch, but you know, 
once you get a certain level of proficiency, then it's like, well, what's the next step, right? Now, for some people, they're going to stick with cross stitch, but they're going to go to like full coverage designs or just massive pieces and like super complicated where you're like using, you're doing your own color blends because you're stitching two threads over two on like 14 count Ada and you're using one thread of this color and one thread of another and you're using um, over dyed variegated threads and stuff like that. And you're, you know, you're essentially um, doing what amounts to uh, pointillism. Uh, if you remember uh, George Surratt, um, but you're kind of doing that with thread. Some people, their next step is they start doing their own original designs. Some people, some of those folks will then uh, go on to start a business with that. Um, some people decide they're going to start exploring other uh, forms of embroidery. So you. Uh, the, usually the next step, so in that sense, uh, cross stitch is like a gateway drug. I'm like seeing, okay, I'm not blocking the camera while I'm standing here. Uh, so usually the next step is then hard anger. Uh, the interesting thing with hard anger, actually, because I was mentioning about um, embroidery forms that were that are threatened. I think in like the 60s or 70s, hard anger would have been considered one of those. But what happened is, um, I forget the name of the actual uh, women involved, but they had a shop called um, the Nordic Needle. Actually, I say had, I think they still do. They may have retired by now. And they both, I think, were of Norwegian extraction or descent. And they had learned how to do hard anger, uh, which is a traditional um, cut work. So very geometric um, Norwegian uh, embroidery. They learned that from their grandmas. So they were they started where they were importing books from Norway. They were like Norwegian instruction books and patterns that they were selling in their shop. And then at a certain point, they'd stitched all of those. They were bored and they started doing their own. And somewhere, if you, I forget the name of it, but there's a video that has to do with like uh, the Norwegian diaspora in like Minnesota or uh, Michigan or Minnesota. And it has, it actually profiles uh, these ladies as well as like talking about, you know, there's a dude who um, is doing like Viking style carvings and whatnot. I think the video is originally, or it's from a documentary that was from the early 90s and they tell the story, but. It's still up there. Um, but anyways, so they started um, to uh, design their own patterns. And then they started having design um, contests type of things. So you would submit your designs. Somebody would be picked as best, would get some sort of a prize. But uh, all of like the finalists would go into a book that would be sold the next year. Um, and those, you can still find those books in thrift stores. I have like a stack of them. Now I am not very good with hard anger, um, but I, the first couple of hard anger pieces that I've been working on are from those books from like 73, 74. Um, and I have friends who are very much into hard anger who can kind of guide me and help me. Uh, but anyway, so hard anger is often one of the next places that people go after um, they're kind of ready to expand their horizons from just cross stitch. Another is um, lace making. Often bobbin lace is your gateway drug there. Um, and But there's also like needle lace, um, all that sort of stuff. So I am intrigued by bobbin lace and lace making. I just ain't got the time. But um, I do have a lot of materials and kits and stuff that I should probably get moving forward on. Lace making is particularly endangered, if you ask me my opinion. Um, like there are still, um, actually I have a friend who's in the local lace making club. Uh, but, you know, compared to even the 90s, there's very few lace makers left who still make handmade bobbin lace and whatnot. But it's starting to have a resurgence. Because some of these ladies who were doing cro um, who started out doing cross stitch and then they expand their horizon. If they were doing floss tube, 
they started talking about Bob and Lace on Floss Tube. So now that, you know, their, their viewers are suddenly going like, oh, Bob and Lace, I never heard of that before. That's really cool. I didn't know you could do that. I thought Bob and I thought Lace was made by machines, or I mean, I think people all knew that at some point it wasn't, but tradition, you know, in recent decades, it's basically been made by machines. So then you're starting to get Bob and Lace coming back from the brink, along with Hard Anger. Um, uh, and then some people eventually sort of join um, an embroidery guild. Like we've got the local one, and then there's a national one, and it's all kind of a nested structure. And then you can go to like the seminars, and you learn new techniques. You learn be you know bead embroidery. Um, there's especially a lot of indigenous bead embroidery that's absolutely beautiful. Um, and then there's you know silk shading. Um, there's you know, what, what is currently kind of being called slow stitch, and it's a little bit kind of, a little bit like sashiko or visible mending, kind of a similar concept, but um, if it's quote unquote slow stitch, it's more, um, uh, it's not necessarily functional, like you would, you might do that on a decorative item, not a used item. So, Let's zoom out so we can sort of, you know, we don't need to see into the kitchen, that's a mess. Um, so yeah, that's starting to add some texture. And the more I do it, the more subtle it becomes. Like the first few, it's like, ah, holy crap. Um, so anyways, here I am talking, I'm t working on a painting while I'm blathering about um, cross stitch and bobbin lace. Um, Oh yeah, so the point of me mentioning that is like stuff like um, stuff like the couch and exhibition and you know various state fairs that still have a hall exhibit like a craft um, sort of thing I think play a big role in uh, showing because you get like members of the public like we're gonna on the first day of couch and exhibition we're gonna have like 400 school children running through the hall being chased after by teachers and parent monitors and all that. But a lot of those little kids, every year, they come up to the needlework tables and they're fascinated by it, you know. Um, and we do have a juniors division. But it's something that just plants a seed and maybe later on, they're, you know, could be 30 years later, they're bored, they need a hobby, and they kind of something pops in their head about that, you know. Or, you know, not necessarily um, the needlework. It could be, you know, um, we've got weavers and spinners and um, you know not that knitting ever was as threatened as some of the embroidery areas but I do think like um, what's her name Debbie Stoller who did the Stitch and Bitch books in the 90s she did a huge huge service in doing those like obviously she was also writing it as like a business for herself but I think for like a generation of uh, Gen X women, I think that was kind of a huge thing because there had been this sort of attitude of rejection of uh, traditional um, handiwork um, done by women. It's kind of an interesting thing how we kind of quote unquote modernize and liberate ourselves by throwing away the things that um, used to be precious commodities and used to. Uh, be sort of uh, networking tools for women um, to find community and whatnot. But if I start talking about that, I'm going to sound like I'm some really pompous academic. But um, <laughs> point is, there like all these things aside from you know uh, benefits to the individual who does them. There is like a societal function of them. It's not just like you know we treat hobbies as if. They are, you know, an individual leisure time and they're a luxury activity and whatnot. And in the last couple hundred years, they kind of have been, especially since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, but they do and always have sort of this bigger purpose, I think. Aside from, you know, obviously there was a time when embroidery was an actual job. It still is an actual job for like a tiny number of people. 
you know, like there's the Royal School of Needlework, there's embroidery teachers, there's people who, if they become good enough, you know, you know, somebody spent thousands of hours working on the uh, coronation robes type of thing. That's all, um, a lot of that was uh, gold work embroidery um, done out of the Royal School of Needlework at, uh, it's not Holyrood Castle, no, that's in Scotland. Um, to do, I'm gonna, I forget the name, but it was one of the ones that uh, Henry VIII had in London. Um, in one of his pas palaces uh, that the Royal School of Needlework is in. Um, so anyways, that is a whole rambling discussion. <laughs> uh, but the base, my basic point is, I think, like, I think it's a huge tragedy that when you go to Vancouver, the Pacific National Exhibition, the PE, like the Hall exhibits, I'm trying to remember if they still had them when I was a small child in the very early 80s. I don't think so. I think it had already become, because they've got, there they have like the PE Forum, and then there's these three long buildings. One of them is like the food fair. And it used to be one of them would have like an exhibit, whether it would be a different country, whether it was like Taiwan or whatever, it would, um, or Japan would come and do almost like a World's Fair type of exhibit in one of the buildings. And then the other was always like a vendors, like people selling mops and all that sort of thing. But now I think even the national, like the national uh, one, I think is even gone. Like there, and there also used to be like a BC exhibit and all that. I think they still, they still have like cows and stuff like that, which is surprising considering some of the population of Vancouver and whatnot, um, and their attitudes it ends up becoming a very political thing. But um, at the same time, it's good to kind of know where your food comes from. That yes, your steak is a moo cow or used to be, and um, life eats life and all that sort of stuff. It's kind of a valuable um, education. But um, anyways, my understanding is, I think certainly I, I had seen something, I, um, there was a book or whatever on the PE, but they were talking about the history. So you know, going back to around the time of the World Wars, they still had like whole exhibits similar to what a lot of the American state fairs have and county fairs and what the Cowichan Exhibition has, but it had, I'm pretty sure it was completely gone by the time I was a kid. Um, I'll stop with this pen. It's not full, it's not out of ink, but it's starting just because of being vertical. The ink is kind of falling back inside. Um, so we will come back to that one. Let's go back with the little dotty one but um anyways so i think when you take out those sort of aspects of like local people doing showing exhibits and showing off their hobbies and um, their talents and whatnot i think it ends up becoming basically a shopping mall experience like a shopping mall with a midway and um, rides and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. That also serves a valuable um, purpose in society, but it does kind of lose a little bit of uh, the community aspect, I think. You know, that's just my opinion. Uh, <laughs> as someone who has, uh, aside from volunteering, also belongs to the Cowichan Exhibition Society and all that, and I'm the one who sits at the meetings Go. I have no idea what's going on. I'm just going to sit here, shut up, and take notes. <laughs> um, you know, got people who've been uh, working and producing the fair for, like, longer than I've been alive. Um, so I defer to their expertise because they know what they're doing and I don't. But it's kind of fascinating to, um, to be living in a community that has that. Um, so, anyways, uh, that's my whole spiel. And the fine arts thing, well, I mean, obviously we've got a lot of other fine arts stuff here in the valley, so it's, it's fun to 
have that uh, corner of the hall for fine arts and nope, almost fell off, almost slipped off my chair when trying to sit on it. Come on. <laughs> like, hear noises, but uh, I may have to make this lower and just kind of so I can use my feet to prop myself up. <laughs> But I suspect I've been probably blathering for a while and probably it's not a bad idea to kind of call it for the video and then when we come back yeah so I do think I am going to continue on doing this but I'm not going to make you guys watch it and I've already lectured you about the importance of your local fair and why you should join and participate um, enough <laughs> for one night so I'm gonna, uh, I'm actually gonna take this off of the easel, move it into the other room, sit on my ass, watch YouTube, and uh, dot and uh, swirl. And, but I promise that's all I will do. If I'm doing more of this graffiti type stuff or drawing around him, I will do that in a video tomorrow. So you don't anyth miss anything important. Um, <laughs> to the extent that any painting I do is important. Uh, so anyways, I will fill that stuff in and not make you guys watch it. And then we will come back tomorrow to put on the finishing touches. And yeah, I think the finishing touches tomorrow are basically going to do some scribble outlines around miles. And, um, then it'll be in just ready in time for the deadline. <laughs> um, but... And that'll be kind of after uh, CowX, because I'm going to have a, a crazy week and a half with that. Um, then I will be back starting on a new painting. And uh, I think I mentioned we we're going to, I'm 90% certain the next one that I'm going to do on YouTube uh, is going to be uh, his buddy Ricky going yowza and his eyeballs bugging out over the girlfriend's. Uh, new very short dress um but that one we will uh, get to later this month so hope you've enjoyed this little thing a uh, little video and lecture about the importance of your local fair um and, or exhibition whatever it's called in your town or county or province or whatever um and i will talk at you next time bye for now